Welcome to Hot and Talken. My name is Dick Sheborn, and in this video, I want to take you on a journey. And that journey is called single variable optimization. So what is a single variable optimization? Well, it's an analysis of a given function where we only have the formula, and this function depends on one variable, the single variable. And we want to understand basic characteristics of that functions, for instance, zeros, that means points where the graph of the function crosses the x-axis, or local maxima, local minima, or asymptotes, and basically everything which is needed to create a sketch of the graph of the function. So in the end we want to do something like this. Yeah? And um, that's a rather lengthy story because there are so many ingredients contained. And that is why that video is rather lengthy. But I hope it's informative and you enjoy it. And I would say, let's go. A single variable optimization is a complete analysis of a given function regarding certain characteristics. The aim of a single variable optimization is to get a good understanding of the graph of the function without knowing the exact graph. Valuable information about the graph is to know about the roots, to know about minimum and maximum points, inflection points, symmetry and so on. A single variable optimization consists of seven steps. The first step is to determine the domain of the function, that means all numbers where the function is defined. The second step is to check for symmetries. For instance, if the graph is symmetrical to the y-axis or the origin. The third step is to identify all roots or zeros. That means all points where the function value is zero. The fourth step is to calculate the first two derivatives of the function, sometimes also the third derivative. That step is needed as a preparation for the fifth and the sixth step, where we calculate the local extreme points in the fifth step and the inflection and settle points in the sixth step. The seventh and last step is to identify possible asymptotes and singularities. In this video, we perform the single variable optimization for the example function f of x equals x to the third power divided by 2 times x squared minus 1. We will walk through all seven steps where for each step I will tell you the method of how to deal with this step for this special function and for general functions. Typically, a single variable optimization is done in situations where we are not supported by computers. However, in this video, we will several times look at the graph of the function which has been created by the computer. It helps us to understand and verify the results we will get in each of the seven steps. Let us directly start with looking at the graph to get a feeling of the look of the function. This is the graph of the function. Let us quickly check which results we will expect in the seven steps. Considering the domain, it seems like that the function is defined for all real numbers except for two points where the function does not seem to be defined. These points are around negative one and positive 1. Looking for symmetries, the function seems to be symmetrical about the origin. The function has exactly one root or zero, that means an x value where the function value is zero, which obviously is x equals zero. The function also has a local minimum, which is situated somewhere between 1 and 2. It also has a local maximum, which is situated somewhere between negative 1 and negative 2. Finally, if x approaches positive or negative infinity, the function seems to approach this asymptote. Additionally, at the two singularities, that means the two points where the function is not defined, the function approaches two vertical asymptotes. Let us now do the calculation for the seven steps and see how we can recreate these results mathematically. So let us start with identifying the domain. The method to determine the domain 
is first to assume that the function is defined for all real numbers. So we start by writing d of f equals r. The second step is if there are numbers where the function formula is not defined. Typical indicators we have to look for when doing this are fractions, square roots and roots in general, logarithms and other elementary functions with restricted domain. Obviously, we have a fraction in this case. It is well known that the denominator of a fraction may not get zero. So we have to exclude all x values where the denominator of f assumes the value zero. To find these x values, we simply set the denominator equal to zero and solve for the x values. So if we solve this equation for x, we get two solutions, x1 equals one, and x2 equals negative 1. So for these two values, the denominator assumes the value 0, which is why we have to exclude 1 and negative 1 from the domain. So we have found that the domain of f are all real numbers except for 1 and negative 1. The next step we check is symmetry. Even though there are many kind of possible symmetries, we restrict our examinations to two kinds of symmetries. First, symmetry to the y-axis and second, symmetry to the origin. If a function is symmetrical to the y-axis, it needs to satisfy this condition for every number x in its domain. Let's look at this example to understand this condition. This function f of x equals 1 over x squared is symmetrical to the y-axis. If we choose some point x on the positive real axis, and if we additionally choose the point negative x on the negative x-axis, it is obvious that because the function is symmetrical, the function values of these two points are the same. That means the function height over these two points is the same. And this property is fulfilled for all values x along the x-axis. This is exactly the condition that f of x must equal f of negative x for all x. So for our function, we simply have to check if this condition is satisfied in order to know if our function is symmetrical to the y-axis. So in order to decide if our function is symmetrical to the y-axis, we have to either verify or falsify this condition. Falsifying this condition is easier, because falsifying means that we can show that there is at least one x in the domain of f such that this condition is not fulfilled. Usually I would recommend testing a very simple value such as x equals 1. But in our case 1 is not part of the domain. So let's check for instance x equals 2. We check if f of 2 equals f of negative 2 f of 2 is 8 over 6, f of negative 2 is negative 8 over 6. These values are not equal. So we have falsified the condition and f is not symmetrical to the y-axis. For checking symmetry to the origin, we have to check a slightly different condition. f of x equals negative f of negative x for all x in the domain of f. So the difference to the condition above is this extra negative sign. Again, we have to either verify or falsify this condition. From our initial considerations, we already know that our example function f is symmetrical to the origin. So we can use it for graphically illustrating the condition for symmetry at the origin. Of course, afterwards, we have to verify it carefully based on the formula. Again, we choose some point x on the x-axis. And we also choose its twin point on the other side, that means negative x. Looking at the respective function values of these two points, we indeed find that they are negative to each other. This is a direct consequence of the fact that f is symmetrical to the origin. And again, this property is fulfilled for any point x along the x-axis.
So if this condition is satisfied for all x in the domain, the function is symmetrical to the origin. We will now verify this. Verifying the condition is a bit harder than falsifying it, because verifying means that we have to prove it for all x in the domain of f, whereas for falsifying it was enough to disprove it for only one x in the domain. However, it is not too hard, because usually we can already tell by looking closely at the formula why it must be satisfied for all x in the domain. We typically start by plugging in negative x into the function formula and look what we get. f of negative x is negative x to the power of 3 divided by 2 times negative x squared minus 1. Now the trick is in this case to treat the negative sign in the powers right, because the expression in the numerator actually equals negative 1 to the power of 3 times x to the power of 3, which is negative x to the power of 3. Negative x to the power of 2, however, is the same as x to the power of 2. So putting all together we indeed have negative x to the power of 3 divided by 2 x squared minus 1, which is nothing else than negative f of x. So you see that we have verified the condition and as our argumentation didn't rely on any special choice of x, we have proven it for every x in the domain of f. Consequently, our function is symmetrical to the origin. The third step of the single variable optimization is to determine the roots of f. Calculating the roots means we have to find all x in the domain of f such that f of x equals 0. So we set our function formula equal to 0. Now a fraction is 0 if and only if its numerator is 0 and its denominator is unequal to 0. So that means we have to find all x such that x to the third power equals 0. This, of course, gives us x equals 0. So the only root of f is x equals 0. This result is in line with the graph of f. In the next step we calculate the derivatives of f. We always calculate the first two derivatives, sometimes we also need the third one. The first two derivatives are needed to calculate local extreme points at step 5. The second derivative and sometimes the third derivative is used to find inflection or settle points at step 6. Let us calculate the first derivative. Because f of x is a quotient of two functions, we use the quotient rule for differentiation. So we take the derivative of the numerator, which is 3x squared, and multiply it with the denominator. Minus the numerator multiplied by the derivative of the denominator, which is 2 times 2x, divided by the square of the denominator, which is 4x squared minus 1 squared. Now that was the application of the quotient rule. But we never leave expressions like this, but we try to simplify them. Let us first expand the brackets in the numerator. So we have 6x to the 4 minus 6x squared minus 4x to the 4 over 4 times x squared minus 1 squared. Combining expressions and reducing by 2, we get x to the power of 4 minus 3x to the power of 2 over 2x squared minus 1 squared. Typically, for rational functions like f, the second derivative is harder to calculate than the first derivative. This is the case here too. So we get the second derivative of f at x is... And again we have to apply the quotient rule. So we take the derivative of the numerator which is 4x to the power of 3 minus 6x 
times the denominator, which is 2x squared minus 1 squared, minus the numerator as it is, x to the power of 4 minus 3x to the power of 2, times the derivative of the denominator, which is 4x squared minus 1 times 2x. That is an application of the chain rule. Divided by the square of the denominator, that is 4x squared minus 1 to the power of 4. Now the first thing we need to observe here is that we can reduce the complete fraction by x squared minus 1. That is the first step we will do. If we don't do that, we will still get the right result, but the calculations get much more complicated and there is a higher risk for calculation errors. Now performing this reduction gives us the following fraction. 4x to the power of 3 minus 6x times 2 times x squared minus 1 without square minus x to the power of 4 minus 3x to the power of 2 times 8x. That is the numerator. Divided by 4x squared minus 1 now to the power of 3. And again we simplify the expression in the numerator and reduce the fraction by 2 at the same time. This gives 4x to the power of 5 minus 4x to the power of 3 minus 6x to the power of 3 plus 6x minus 4x to the power of 5 plus 12x to the power of 3 divided by 2x squared minus 1 to the power of 3. Now if we combine matching expressions in the numerator, we have now 4x to the power of 5 cancels away with minus 4x to the power of 5 minus 4x to the power of 3 minus 6x to the power of 3 is minus 10x to the power of 3 plus 12x to the power of 3 is plus 2x to the power of 3. And finally we have plus 6x divided by 2 x squared minus 1 to the power of 3 and that gives x to the power of 3 plus 3x divided by x squared minus 1 to the power of 3. These are the first and the second derivative. Now we use the first and the second derivative to take care of the fifth point, local extreme points. Before we start calculating let's have some general thoughts about extreme points. We say that a function f has a local maximum at a point c if there exists an interval alpha beta about c such that f of x is smaller than or equal to f of c for all points x in the interval alpha beta which are in the domain of the function f. In simpler words, c is a local maximum if its function value is locally maximal. That means there is no greater function value in the neighborhood of C. Similarly, the function f has a local minimum at C if there exists an interval alpha beta about C such that f of x is greater than or equal to f of C for all x in alpha beta which are in the domain of f. So a local maximum is a point which is locally maximal. That means all function values in its immediate neighborhood are smaller than or equal to the function value of the local maximum. In some greater distance from the local maximum, however, there may be function values which are greater than the function value of the local maximum. So for our function, a local maximum is somewhere around here. Similarly, a local minimum is somewhere around here. Now the question is, how do we find local extreme points when we are only given the formula of our function? Well, in many cases this is quite simple. There is something which is called a necessary condition and something that is called a sufficient condition. The necessary condition is the rather well-known fact 
that at a local extreme point the derivative of f must be zero. That means that the tangent at f is horizontal. The sufficient condition, on the other hand, means that if additionally the second derivative of f at x is greater than zero, we have a local minimum at x. And, on the other hand, if the second derivative of f at x is smaller than zero, we have a local maximum. So the way how to find local extreme points basically consists of these two steps. We first have to identify all points where the tangent to the function f is horizontal. That means we have to identify all points x where the first derivative of x is zero. In the second step, we have to test for each of the points where the first derivative of f is zero, if the second derivative of f at this point is greater than zero, then we have a local minimum, or if the second derivative of f at x is smaller than zero, then we have a local maximum. In some cases, the second derivative of f at x is exactly equal to zero. In these cases, we have to dive a little deeper to understand if we have a local minimum, a local maximum or something else, so-called settle point. Let us try to understand these two conditions and the way of how to find local extreme points graphically. We first fix some point on the graph of f. We then draw the tangent line to the graph of f through that point. If we now move around that point, the tangent line changes accordingly. As I said before, the first step consists in finding all points where the tangent is horizontal. That should be this one around here, and it also should be this one around here, and finally this one. So a horizontal tangent is the necessary condition. That means if I have a local minimum or a local maximum, the condition of a horizontal tangent must necessarily be fulfilled. However, in turn, a horizontal tangent is not sufficient to know if we have a local minimum or a local maximum, because we also have that point here at zero, which is neither a local maximum nor a local minimum. It is a so-called settle point. So in order to definitely decide if a point is a local maximum or a local minimum, we need the sufficient condition. The sufficient condition is an additional condition which consists of two parts, the first of them saying that if the second derivative is strictly positive at the point, then we have a local minimum. Let's try to understand this. A strict positive second derivative at a point means that the function is locally convex at that point. In other words, it means that the change rate of the first derivative is positive. And again, in other words, that means that the slope of the tangent line is growing when I move through our point from left to right. And we can verify that here by moving the point from left to right and watching how the slope of the tangent line is growing. A growing slope of the tangent line ensures that the graph is curved to the left. And this is exactly what we need for a local minimum. On the other hand, if we move from left to right through the maximum point, we see that the slope of the tangent line is decreasing. That corresponds to the fact that the second derivative is negative. That means that the change rate of the first derivative is negative. That means that the first derivative is decreasing when we move through that point. In a graphical perspective, that means that the graph is curved to the right. This is exactly what we need for a local maximum. To understand that even better, let us draw the graph of the first derivative of f into our picture. So we see that the yellow curve of the first derivative 
crosses or touches the x-axis three times at the maximum point, at the saddle point and at the minimum point. Recall that the height of the yellow derivative function corresponds to the slope of the tangent line. That means in this area here we have a slightly positive slope of the tangent. At the maximum point we have a tangent slope of zero, followed by a very steeply decreasing tangent slope. In particular, the tangent slope changes from positive to negative when it goes through that zero here, that means when it goes through the maximum. The same holds for the minimum point, just the other way round, that means with changed signs. The slope of the tangent changes from negative through zero to positive when we move through the minimum point. Now something interesting happens here around the saddle point because you see that the slope comes from negative values, touches zero and returns to negative values. And that fits to the observation that we have a tangent which is negatively sloped, which is horizontal and again of negative slope. So at a saddle point the first derivative touches zero but does not cross the x-axis, as happens here for the maximum or the minimum point. Let us now return to our seven-step plan of our single variable optimization. We're currently still working on the local extreme points, step number five. As we have understood now, we first have to identify the so-called stationary points, that means the points where the first derivative of f equals zero. To do this, we simply take the first derivative, which we have already calculated in step 4, and set it equal to 0. Again, a fraction is 0 if the numerator is 0 and we don't have any problems with the denominator. That means that the denominator doesn't assume the value 0, which we have excluded by the choice of our domain of f. So we translate this to the condition that the numerator should be 0. Now to find all x values which satisfy this equation, the first step is to factor out x squared. In this way we have a product on the left hand side and a product is zero when one or both of its factors are zero. The first factor x squared is zero if and only if x itself is zero. So we have a first stationary point at x equals zero. The second factor in the product, x squared minus 3, is 0 if x squared is equal to 3. This is the case if x is either positive or negative square root of 3. So there are two additional stationary points, x2 equals positive square root of 3 and x3 equals negative square root of 3. Now we are done checking the necessary condition. That means if there are local extreme points, they must be among these three. The next and final step is to check the sufficient condition. That means we have to check for all three stationary points what happens to the second derivative of f. We do this by simply plugging in x1, x2 and x3. It is easy to see that for x1 we have zero. For x2 we have this expression, which can be simplified to, which is a positive number. Finally, for x3 we get, which is a negative number. So we have found that at x2, that means at the square root of 3, we have a minimum, and at x3, at negative square root of 3, we have a maximum. As at x1 the second derivative is 0, there are still several possibilities. In fact, it could be either a minimum, a maximum or a saddle point. We will deal with this question in step 6. By now, step 5 has been finalized and we can secure our results.
we now turn to step 6, inflection points and settle points. Loosely speaking, an inflection point is a point where the graph of f changes its curve direction. That means, for instance, if it changes from a left curve to a right curve or from a right curve to a left curve. A settle point is an inflection point with the additional condition that it has a horizontal tangent. In some sense, inflection points can be thought of local extreme points of the first derivative of f. Let us illustrate this here with the sine function. Again, we choose a point on the graph along with its tangent line. At zero, the graph of f has an inflection point where the graph changes from a left curve to a right curve. A left curve means that if we move from left to right, we have a growing slope of the tangent. You can see how it grows. We are in a left curve. If it now changes from a left curve to a right curve, the slope of the tangent starts to decrease. Now we are in a right curve. That means that at the inflection point, the slope of the tangent has reached a maximum. There is also an inflection point at x equals pi. Here the graph of the function changes from a right curve to a left curve. That means we have a decreasing slope of the tangent which reaches its minimum in the inflection point and which starts growing again. So inflection points where the curve direction changes from right to left represent local minima of the first derivative. As it is well known, the first derivative of the sine function is the cosine function. You see that the cosine attains its minimum here at pi and its maximum here at zero, which affirms our considerations. So in order to check for inflection points, we have to play through the same game as we did for checking for extreme points, but only for the first derivative of f. That means in the first step we have to find the stationary points of the first derivative. That means the points where the first derivative of the first derivative are zero. That means points where the second derivative of f is zero. Again, we use the expression for the second derivative, which we have already calculated in step four. And again, we have a fraction, so we set the numerator equal to zero. Again, we look for a common factor and factor them out. In this case, the common factor is x. Now we have a product and we have to check when each of the factors of this product assumes the value zero. The first one, x, is obviously zero whenever x is zero. That means we have found the first candidate for an inflection point, x1 equals zero. Now the second factor of the product is x squared plus three. As x squared is always a positive number, x squared plus three can never attain the value zero. That means this factor does not contribute any more candidates for inflection points. So x1 equals zero is our only candidate. Now, as before, when looking for extreme points, there is a sufficient condition. However, we are not interested what type of inflection point we have. That means we are not interested if the first derivative has a local minimum or a local maximum. We're just interested in the fact that it does have a local extremum. This is the case if the second derivative of the first derivative, which is the third derivative, is either strictly smaller or strictly greater than zero, altogether if it is unequal to zero. So we need to check if at our candidate point the third derivative of f is unequal to zero. This is exactly the point where I have told you before that we might need the third derivative of f. Now, as we have learned from calculating the first and the second derivatives, it is quite tedious to calculate the third derivative. So we would like to avoid this. In fact, this is possible, 
because there is an alternative way to check the sufficient condition. And this is that we can alternatively check if the second derivative changes its sign at the candidate point. We can check that by looking at the numerator of the second derivative. As the second factor, x squared plus 3, is always greater than 3, the only relevant factor which could contribute to a sign change is the factor x. And indeed, at the candidate for the inflection point x1 equals 0, x changes its sign. Consequently, the complete expression changes its sign at the inflection point candidate. This proves that x1 equals 0 is indeed an inflection point. And because at x1 equals 0, we also have a horizontal tangent to f, which we have already shown before, we conclude that x1 equals 0 is even a settle point. This concludes step 6 in the single variable optimization. This brings us to the seventh and last step asymptotes and singularities. An asymptote is a non-vertical line which is approached by the function when f tends to positive or negative infinity. In precise words, a non-vertical line y equals ax plus b, that is the line equation, is said to be an asymptote as x tends to infinity, or if x tends to negative infinity, to the curve given by y equals f of x, if the difference between f of x and the line formula, that is ax plus b, tends to zero if x tends to infinity or if x tends to negative infinity. An example is the function f of x equals 1 over x, which has the horizontal asymptote y equals zero. Another example is the function f of x equals x plus 1 over x, which has the asymptote y equals x. If the function we are looking at is a rational function, that means a quotient of two polynomials, there is an easy way to identify a possible asymptote. The trick is to perform polynomial division of the two polynomials. Our example function f is such a rational function. So for finding an asymptote, we perform a polynomial division of the numerator and the denominator. Doing this, the first summand of the result is 1 over 2 times x. So that we subtract x to the third power minus x. The subtraction gives positive x. And we see that our polynomial division has a remainder. And this remainder is plus x over 2x squared minus 2. Now, why did we do that? Because the remainder expression always tends to zero when x tends to positive or negative infinity. And that means that the other summand in general is the formula of a function which f approaches as x tends to positive or negative infinity. Now, if this function is a linear function, which it is in this case, we have found the formula for a linear asymptote. The reason why I stress the word linear is the fact that we could have other formulas here with higher order terms of x. In these cases, we could also have a quadratic asymptote or a cubic asymptote or, in general, a polynomial asymptote. However, for a single variable optimization, we typically are interested in linear asymptotes as in the definition on the left-hand side. Now let's talk about singularities. A singularity is a point on the x-axis where the function f is not defined, but where the function is defined for all points near the singularities. A typical singularity is a point where the domain of f is interrupted by only one point. In case of the function x plus 1 over x, we have a singularity at 0. In many cases, such singularities are so-called poles. A pole is a singularity where the function approaches positive or negative infinity when x approaches the pole. This is the case here. 
at poles, we have vertical asymptotes. In this case, the y-axis. When analyzing singularities in the context of a single variable optimization, our aim is to understand if these singularities are poles. In order to decide that, we have to examine the behavior of the function near the singularity. And this means we have to examine the limit of the function values as x approaches the singularity. If the function values tend to positive or negative infinity, like here, we have found that we have a pole and thus a vertical asymptote. In many cases, we can use the following simple rule to decide if a singularity is a pole. For functions which are quotients of two functions, that means for a function f of x, which can be written as u of x over v of x, the singularity x0 is a pole if the function v, that means the denominator at x0 is 0, and if the function u, that means the numerator at x0 is unequal to 0. That condition is easy to check in many cases. We can also apply it for our example function. Now remember first that our example function has only two gaps in its domain. So the domain is the complete real axis except for the points negative 1 and 1. That means negative 1 and 1 are singularities for f. Now our example function is the quotient of two functions. So we can apply the rule on the left hand side to check if these two singularities of f are poles. In fact, the numerator x to the power of 3 is unequal to 0 for both negative 1 and positive 1. At the same time, it is also easy to see that the denominator is 0 for both positive and negative 1. So, according to the rule, both singularity points are poles. And this concludes step 7 of the single variable optimization and we can secure our results. Let us have a final look at the graph of the function and verify that everything is correct. Step 1. The domain. The domain of the function is the complete real axis except for the points negative 1 and positive 1. Step 2. Symmetry. The function is symmetrical to the origin. Step 3. Roots. The only root of the function is at x equals 0. Step 4, 5 and 6. f has a local maximum at negative square root of 3, f has a local minimum at positive square root of 3 and f has a settle point at x equals 0. Finally, step 7. f has an asymptote with the equation y equals 1 half x and f has a pole at negative 1 and positive 1 which means that f has vertical asymptotes at negative 1 and positive 1. Now these are all information we have collected in the single variable optimization. Now imagine you know this information, but you don't know how the graph of f exactly looks like. An extra final step in a single variable optimization then consists of sketching the graph of the function f. So that was a complete walkthrough of an example single variable optimization. Thanks for watching and see you next time.